It's good to have you here this morning. I'd like you, if you would, to take your Bible, go to Isaiah chapter number 43, Isaiah 43, if you'll turn there. And uh, I'd like you also to notice in your bulletin, there's some notes that I want to encourage you to use today as we look into the Word of God and this particular message, which I've titled, Leaving Your Past Behind. Isaiah chapter 43, if you're a guest with us today, maybe it's your first or second or third time here, you're just kind of checking us out. I want to say thank you for being with us today. I'm honored that you're here, and I trust as we look into the Word of God that you'll get a help from the message today, Isaiah 43. Let's do this. Let's read just a couple verses, and then I'd like to have a word of prayer with you, and I'd like us to together ask the Lord to meet with us and ask the Lord to use His Word to speak to our hearts and and really be a help to us in this particular area of learning to leave your past behind. Isaiah 43, notice if you would, verse 18. The Bible says, Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? It will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Would you read verse number 18 with me? The Bible says, read verse 18 with me. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we have to fellowship together around your word. Thank you so much for the many reminders that we find in the scriptures which tell us to forget those things which are behind and to press toward the prize of the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And I pray that we would do just that today by your grace. And I pray if there's somebody here today not saved, they'll trust the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And we'll thank you for it and give you the glory, for it's in Christ's name we pray, and amen. Now, the subject we're going to address today affects virtually everybody. Some, more than others, really depending on your past. The longer you live, the more potential you have of being hurt by somebody or uh, an a issue with some grief about a particular situation, but there are certain things in life that for whatever reason, we have a hard time getting over. We have a hard time getting over. It could be something that happened to you during a childhood. It could be a marriage that, that went south. I told the early service, I said, and that doesn't mean Arizona. It just went down. It could be a friendship that turned ugly. It might be something that was said about you personally. Maybe an attack on your character. Maybe an attack on your children. Whatever be the case, the Bible is crystal clear that we are to do the best we can to leave our past, what? Behind. Have you ever met somebody who just constantly lives in the past? That's just where they live. And it doesn't, sure, sure, we can talk about the glory days and all of that. I'm not going to get into that today. And that has its own potential for problems. But I'm talking about people that, that they've been hurt and they cannot seem to let it go. The Bible's just, like I said, crystal clear on how we're to be able to uh, deal with that. Let me give you just a couple things, if I could, that will happen to you and that will happen to me if we don't learn to let go of certain things that take place in our past. Number one, it can rob you of your current relationship with God. Right now, if you've got issues with your past and you haven't let it go, it will hinder your relationship with God. Number two, it will rob you of your joy today. Take it away because you're still dealing with things from your past. Can I say this? It will cause you physical health problems today. 
It will destroy present relationships today. You know, it doesn't matter how wealthy you are, how much money you have, what title you've got, uh, your position, your prestige, any of those things. It doesn't matter because if you, have, if you don't have good relationships with people today, you're absolutely miserable. And that is because life is made up of relationships. And I think it's important that we know that. Your happiness is largely determined by your ability to get along with people. You can't take, you cannot relate to the present if you're still reacting to the past. I want to say that again because I want you to think about it. You can't relate to the present if you're still reacting to what happened in the past. It's a deterrent. You know, we bring many unresolved problems into relationships. Uh, when a couple walks down the aisle and they get married, uh, many times they have no idea, and it really depends on their past, but a, a lot of the times they have no idea some of the emar- emotional baggage and the emotional garbage that is brought into that relationship. And, and if it's undealt with, it will do nothing but haunt you during that present relationship. And I think it's important that we're honest with ourselves. We all carry some kind of emotional baggage. We all carry it. We all carry it. Many times we rehearse our resentments. We go over and over and over and over our bitterness. Have you ever had a situation before where, where somebody hurt you, somebody said something about you, and then you can't wait to be able to go to them or in your mind? How many times have you revisited that and you've brought it up and you know exactly what you're going to say? You're in the shower and you are just giving it to that person, right? Because you rehearse that resentment. You rehearse it people you're angry against, the people that hurt you. Not only that, many times you remember the regrets. You know, if I, how about if I would have said this? Or, or I should have never said this. How many of you have regretted sometimes you've said something you shouldn't have said? Say amen. When you do those things, what happens is you react to relationships rather than enjoy them. So what's the answer? Well, the answer, look at Isaiah 43. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Forget the former, focus on the future. Number one, notice in your notes, how do you do that? I must let go of grudges. That's number one in your notes. Let go of grudges. Ephesians chapter 4. Notice verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you. I want you to notice that part in the middle there that says, be put away from you. God gives you some specific things that you're to put away. And number one is bitterness. You're to put it away. But sometimes we don't. We harbor it. We have it. We hold on to it. Do you know, I think bitterness and grudges kind of go together. They're, they're on, almost synonymous, a grudge and bitterness. Well, what does the Bible say about bitterness? Well, what I did, I went to my, exo- uh, my concordance, and I did a word study just on that word bitterness. I, let me challenge you sometime, just an interesting little study. Do a study on the word bitterness. And one thing that really stood out to me is Proverbs 14, 10. It says this, very simple. The heart knoweth its own bitterness. Guess what, folks? You and I know when we're bitter. We know it. We try to hide it. We try to mask it. But the heart knows its own bitterness. Did you know when a rattlesnake is cornered, sometimes it's so angry that it bites, it, it bites itself. And when a man harbors hatred or bitterness, he's simply poisoning himself just like the rattlesnake that bites you, that bites itself, excuse me. Now, here's one of the problems. Don't miss this. Here's what we do. We will justify to the nth degree our bitterness because, don't miss this, well, you don't understand what they said. 
You don't understand what they did. You don't understand what happened to me. And guess what? I don't understand and I never belittle somebody's pain or circumstances or what has happened to them. I, I never belittle it because it's, sometimes it's huge. But guess what we do? I can be bitter. I can be angry. I can be resentful because of the magnitude of what they did. So we justify it. We give ourselves an exemption because of what was said or because of what happened. We're justified in our business and we, in, our, in our bitterness. And guess what? You, you, you think that that doesn't affect other people around you. You say, well, oh, it's just me. I'm not affecting anybody else. I'm bitter, but that's just me. But you don't understand your bitterness affects the relationships with everybody around you. And so there is no exemption. Now, we'll get into it in a little bit. How do you deal with it? And forgiveness, as I've mentioned before, does not mean reinstatement. We'll talk about that in a minute. But I want you to consider this verse. Very simple. Listen carefully, please, about bitterness and how it affects other people. Looking diligently, Hebrews 12, 15, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, watch this, lest any root of bitterness spring up and trouble you, watch, and thereby many be defiled. I'm going to say it again. Many be defiled. How many? Many. So, so the root of bitterness, I'm just going to give an example here that, that maybe creeps up in you, that's going to affect other people around you. And sometimes it's unbeknownst to you because, you know, well, bless God, I have the right. You ever notice whenever somebody, times says, somebody, somebody says, bless God, they're about to say something really stupid. Well, bless God, and you just got to watch what's next. So we're to put away bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking. And if you don't, watch this, it will ruin your current relationships. Because you can't have a right relationship in the present if you're still dealing with issues from the past. And by the way, just as a little parenthetical here, this is not psychobabble. This is scripture. Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Some of you today have not let go of past grudges and bitterness, and it's still haunting you today. Few things will cause more damage to a relationship than resentment. When you are resentful, it doesn't upset the other person. Guess what? It upsets you. You're sitting at home and you're resentful and they're out having a great time and you're frustrated and saying, I can't stand that person. <laughs> and they're out just having a, a, you know, a great time. Pastor Blue tells a story. He, uh, for, I always... I forget, I just say Pastor Blue, and a lot of people uh, new to Open Door don't know this church has had only one pastor for four decades outside of me, and he was our founding pastor. And uh, so he would always say, you know, uh, he'd tell the story. I had a situation in, in my ministry that there was a lady that said, I've got to come see you. He said, okay. And so sure enough, uh, she comes in to see him, and he's sitting at his desk, and she's just, she is pacing back and forth behind his desk, just like this. He's like, you know, you can sit down. She says, I can't sit down. Well, what's wrong? I'm bitter. I'm mad at you. She said, I've had a horrible week. He said, I've had a great week. You know, just, <laughs> just, just you understand, she, she was bitter, and it was affecting her and not the other person. Pastor Blue said, I've had a great week. And I think you get the point. Resentment never hurts the other person. It hurts you. I think it's important that we all keep that in mind. Not only that, you can be resentful, but it will never change the past. No matter how bitter, how resentful, how frustrated you are, it isn't going to change what happened in the past. You can't go back and redo it. So why live today like a masochist and just not enjoy life because of something that happened to you in the past? Isaiah says, forgetting the former things. You got to let it go. You have to put it behind you. It never, resol it never resolves the problem. It only makes things worse. No matter how much you resent, it will never change the past. I want to say this too, just as a side note. It's very controlling. 
very controlling. Uh, when somebody says, you know, you make me so mad, you're admitting your weakness. You make me so mad. <laughs> there can, you know, nobody can make you mad. You have to allow them to make you mad. But guess what? I do it all the time. <laughs> you made me so mad. This will shock you, but Mary and I had a disagreement recently. <laughs> we've never had an argument in 22 years, but we've had some disagreements. What helped me is when Pastor Blue said when they first got married, you know, the, I don't know, it was like the couch and something else ended up on the front yard. It's like, man, there's hope. So, so we had a disagreement and, and I said, I'm very disconcerted about this situation. Basically, I'm mad. Nobody can make you mad without your permission. You're allowing them to make you mad. Everyone has had situations in the past that hurt them. You know that? Everybody has. And again, the longer you live, the more potential for that. But some of you are continuing to allow people from the past to control you even in the present, though they're not even around anymore. You're still allowing it. So what's God's advice? Forgetting those things which are behind. Putting away bitterness Who are you holding a grudge against? Old friend, former spouse, employer, parent, brother, sister, somebody that you're just, it's there and you've got it and, and, and you, you try to mask it. You, you, you've suppressed it. But guess what? You, this is what you're not getting. When God says that root of bitterness that springs up, it will defile you. You can suppress it and it will cause you physical health problems if you do not learn to deal with it the right way. Many people are still fighting their parents subconsciously of what happened to them in their childhood. Still there. Listen, you've moved, but you kept the hurt. So what are you going to do? Well, the answer is in Isaiah 43. Remember not the former things. In Philippians 3, forgetting those things which are what? Behind. It's not fair when many times people will take it out on their husband or their wife or their children because of what happened to them in the past. So again, the answer is give it to God. Now watch this. The end of, it's in your notes. It's in your notes. I want to show you something real quick. This is the answer. Thank you, Elijah. Watch this. At the very end, it says, look at verse 32. Forgiving one another even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. So it's easy for me to get up here and to say, something, well, you know, bless God, you ought to forgive. Well, I don't even know how bad you've really been hurt. So I just know that God's told me if I've been hurt, I need to forgive. And that'd be the same thing. Here's the irony of it. You don't want to, you don't want to lose sight of this. Forgetting those things which are behind, but forgiving one another as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Guess what? You've been forgiven. Therefore, you're to forgive. This is where the rubber meets the road, and this is where people really get into the struggle, and that's this. They think if I forgive, then that automatically means that person has to be back in my life. That's the problem, where I find in dealing with people in almost 20 years of ministry, I've observed that, but don't forget this. Forgiveness does not mean reinstatement. You're just trying to get that right between you and the Lord nothing between you and your Savior. So forgiving one another as Christ, as, uh, Christ for uh, God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Number two, notice in your notes, I must give up my grief. I must give up my grief. Would you turn in your Bible to 2 Samuel? I have, to, I have some verses in there, but I want you to see this as well. I'll make a few comments. Give up my grief. No, I'm just trying to do the best I can this morning in the few minutes I have just to kind of be a help to you and encouragement. That's my desire. My prayer is, Lord, I pray you'll use this message to help somebody. I don't have anybody in mind in the early service we had, in this service. I just know this is the direction the Lord led me and let the chips fall where they may and hopefully somebody will get some help with this. But I know 
when I preach a message like this, you have to make the decision. I can admonish and implore and exhort and say, yeah, you got to do this. Give up your grief, okay? But you have to be the one to do it, right? I can't do it for you. Second Samuel, can I give you a little backstory to what took place here in Second Samuel chapter number 12? This is David. David saw Bathsheba bathing there and, and made the grave mistake and sent one of his servants and said, bring her to me. He laid with her. They had a child. He took her husband, sent him out, Uriah, to the heat of the battle, put him in the very front. Uriah was killed, okay? And um, he carried his, own, gave, carried his own death warrant as he gave it to Joab. Boom, he's gone. God saw what David did. And he sent that bony-fingered preacher by the name of Nathan and told him a little story about the man that came along and had a, it says, a little ewe lamb. And he says to him, he says, you know, he came along and he had this little ewe man. And David's looking at him, he's like, yeah. And he says, he laid with him. He was a poor man. That's all he had. It was, it was his. It was his own precious little thing. And he, he did everything with it. And a rich man came along who had a bunch of lambs and said, take that one little ewe lamb and I want you to kill it and give it to this such and such and let's make a feast. God saw what took place and Nathan, and David looked at Nathan and said, whoever did that, David said, he's going to be judged. And guess what? That bony fingered preacher stuck his finger in David's face and said, thou art the man because you took Bathsheba. That was the picture of the little lamb. That's all he had. Guess what? God pronounced judgment, said you're going to be judged. The child's going to die. Child's going to die. David gets on his face and weeps and prays and fasts and says, God, please save the child. Now let's pick it up in verse number. You're in 2 Samuel. Watch what happens. Verse number. Well, let's, let's jump up to verse number. 16. David besought God. And, I, and I, let me say this before we read. I mentioned this a month ago. I brought this up for a reason again because I only just barely hit it. And I had many people come to me and said, you know what? I really needed that. So I want to flesh it out just a little more so you get the whole picture. David besought God for the child. He fasted and went in and lay upon the earth. And the elders of the house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died, and the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, basically, he's going to lose it. While the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will they then vex himself if we tell him the child's dead? But look at verse 19. David saw his servants whispering. And David perceived that the child was dead. And David said unto the servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Now I want you to stop for one minute. Look up here. David knew when he heard him talking what had taken place. He'd been mourning. He'd been praying. He'd been fasting. He hadn't eaten. Look at verse 20. Once he found out, David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself, changed his apparel, went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. David went to church. He came to his own house and required that they set bread before him. So basically he eat, he uh, started eating and so on and so on. Let's be honest. Grief is a normal part of life. Everybody eventually experiences loss. When my mom passed away, I was telling Mrs. Knowles this morning after the first service, when my mom passed away, I dealt with a grief that I'd never dealt with before. And I was struggling. Now it mourned over the loss of my mother. But I don't still live there. Doesn't mean I don't still miss her. Doesn't mean that sometimes I don't think about her and you have some emotions. But I want you to understand this. There's nothing wrong with mourning. Does the Bible say, blessed are they that mourn? But there is a difference between mourning and moaning. You get that? Moaning is self-pity. We're pretty good. Sometimes when I'm having a pity party, I got streamers. I got the whole thing as I'm wallowing. And it's a very self-centered thing to do. Wallowing, woe is me. I quit. I'll never be happy again. I've lost it all. Listen, you, don't have, you haven't lost it all. You're still here. 
And we do it. It's part of what we do. May I say this? That's not the answer. How do you handle grief? Look at verse 20, and we'll kind of get ready to move on. David arose from the earth. I told you the backstory. Told you what happened. You know what David did? He accepted what could not be changed. We see here David accepted the circumstances. Many of you are in pain now from events that happened years ago. Years ago. And the key to your peace of mind is one word. That's acceptance, letting go of the grief, downplaying the grief. Don't make it bigger than it is. Child died. David arose from the earth, washed himself and so on. And guess what he did? He got, took a shower, got dressed, had a meal, went to church and said, they said, well, you were mourning, David, what's going on? He said, listen, the child died. I can't bring him back again. Verse 22 says, he says this, he died, I'm not gonna go to him, I, he's not gonna come back to me, but I will go to him and I will see him again. That's what David says. People ask, are we gonna see our loved ones in heaven? I believe the answer to that is yes. So focusing on you know, uh, that, just like in Isaiah, Isaiah 6, the Bible says this, Isaiah says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. He saw the Lord. Sometimes God has to remind us that he's bigger than our circumstances. And he wants us to get our eyes off our circumstances and our eyes on him. Not always easy to do, but we need to, and I'll tell you one last thing David did, and then one thing that you and I both need to do in times like this. David did not focus on what was lost. He focused on what he still had. And can I say this? You know what we need to do in times of grief, in times of loss, in times of mourning, in times of... We need to not look at what we lost. Why don't we take a look at what we still have? Praise God. He said, well, what do I have? You have your life. If you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit living and dwelling in you. You have the Bible. You have a local church. You have your friends. You have your health. You have this. You have that. You have so much to be thankful for. But some people, it doesn't matter. You can remind them a million times, and it won't make any difference because they were weaned on a dill pickle, and they're just negative. You ever met anybody like that? They're just, it doesn't matter what you do. It's always negative. Okay, you don't even want to ask them how they're doing because you're afraid they'll tell you. You met somebody like that? So, how, hey, good to see you. Yeah, praise God. Good, yeah, praise the Lord. Yep, hasta luego. You know, and just, you're scared. Self-pity has the potential of being much more damaging to your life than tragedy, any tragedy you'll ever face because self-pity perpetuates the pain. See, the loss is gone. You, David got up, he arose, and he moved on. But self-pity perpetuates the pain. And we have to be very careful along those lines. Thirdly, and lastly, I'd like you to notice uh, Proverbs 10. It's in your notes. You can turn there if you'd like. I must stop living in guilt. I must stop living in guilt. Proverbs 10 and verse 22, the Bible says this, the blessing of the Lord maketh rich. And he addeth, I love it, I love it, I love it. No sorrow with it. That's one of my favorite verses. The blessing of the Lord maketh rich. So who's, the, help me out, who's the blessing from? The Lord. He maketh, and he adds no sorrow with it. Do you know what? Some of you are here this morning, some were in the early service. You have worked your whole life. Brother Jones and I were talking yesterday. He was in my office. We had a great conversation. And he's worked hard as, in the military and served our country. And now working for the uh, school and as a counselor and has just been a help. And obviously in his local church. And we're just talking about life. And as we were talking, I started thinking, you know, you've worked really hard. And God's blessed you. Do you know what? If you're here this morning and you've worked really hard, and, and you, maybe you, you've got something or you, you've got a home or you have something nice. You don't need to sit there and live in guilt because you have something nice. It's a blessing of the Lord and he adds no sorrow with it. Guess what? We add the sorrow. We, you know, we feel sometimes so undeserving and I know we are undeserving, 
But if God's blessed you, why don't you just say, praise God, amen, shame on the devil, and enjoy it. But, and, and I'm preaching partially to myself, because I'm like a masochist, you know, I don't know. I, I said in the early service, I think I'd made, I would have made a good Catholic. I don't know why. I just, you know, I just, I don't know. Listen, we have liberty in Christ. We don't need to, we're not going to make ourselves accepted in the beloved. We are accepted in the beloved, period. I preached on Ruth last week and Ruth, yeah, yeah, Ruth, sorry, Ruth, Rahab. And there's Rahab. She had nothing to commend herself to the Lord. She was a Gentile. She was an idol worshiper. She, uh, um, she was a, a harlot. She had nothing to commend herself to the Lord. But guess what? God showed up, intervened in her life, blessed her, saved her whole family, and she ended up in the ancestry of the Lord Jesus Christ. So don't feel guilty for just living. Don't feel guilty. Um, we... Uh, my wife and I we were talking, my kids went to camp uh, to help out in the junior camp last week or the week before. And, and uh, I said, honey, I said, the kids are gone. I said, what do you want to do? I said, what do you, let's just go do something. And she said, well, I, you know, I'd really like to get to the office and I'd really like to get caught up and I've got this to do. And I, and let's work. And she, I was working in the yard. She had me working in the yard and she loves to work. That is her joy to work. She tells me my life is a vacation. Okay? So I don't know what that means, but the blessing of the Lord maketh rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. I keep repeating that verse to myself. Many people refuse to accept forgiveness from God, and they hang on to their guilt. They lock themselves into a prison as if they're paying for their own sins. Folks, you don't need to do that. Sometimes subconsciously they do it, forgetting that they're accepted by the beloved. I've met so many people who are torturing themselves today with guilt, torturing their mate or their children or their loved ones with guilt for things that happened long before they were ever married. And they haven't learned to bury it and to put it under the blood, and to move forward, and they keep bringing it out like a sore, and they keep taking the scab off, and they keep exposing the wound. So the question is, how do you let go of your guilt? There's two approaches to guilt. Two approaches. One is right, one is wrong. And as we close the message today, I want to give you those two examples. Watch this. One was Peter, and one was Judas. Peter, if you remember, denied the Lord. Did he not? Judas also, Matthew 27, denied the Lord. Both of them, and I'm not going to get into the doctrinal aspect of, or the eschatology side of you know, Judas and the prophecy that he was you know, going to be one filled with the devil. I'm not going to get I'm just using that as an example. So uh, give me a little liberty here. Peter and Judas... Judas responded after he, after he uh, betrayed the Lord. Folks, he responded with self-condemnation. And I'll read you the verse in Matthew 27. Judas, which betrayed him, saw that he was condemned, repented himself, and departed. And he basically, you know, he threw the 30 pieces of silver back at him and said, I've betrayed innocent blood. And the Bible says that he went out and hanged himself. That's how Judas responded to his failure and to his denying of the Lord. Basically said, I've blown it. I've made the biggest mistake anybody could ever man make, and he hung himself. That's the wrong way to deal with guilt. Peter, on the other hand, responded. Matthew 26, 75, Peter remembered the word that Jesus had said unto him and he went out and he wept bitterly. He didn't hang himself. He went out and wept. He went out and prayed. And guess what? Guess what? God ended up using him not too long after that in a mighty way, if you remember, at Pentecost. You say, why do you bring that up? I bring that up 
as we close the message to say this, there's different ways to handle guilt. One is bad and one is good. You don't need to have self-condemnation. There's a way to get forgiveness and that's just by simply asking for it. You don't need to sit there and beg God, please forgive me, I beseech you, I implore you, would you forgive me? He says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, Lord, if you forgive me, I, I'll never do it again. Yes, you will. <laughs> Why don't we just be honest with ourselves? Lord, if you forgive me, I'll start, I'll, add, I'll take on another missionary and, and help Brother Roberts and I'll start tithing. Another. Why, you don't need to make a foxhole prayer to God. Why don't you just know he's going to forgive you when you go to him and then do the best you can to move forward and press toward the prize of the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. How is it with you today? Be honest with yourself. Be honest with yourself. How are you handling grudges? How are you handling grief? How are you dealing with guilt? How are you dealing with it? Well, today I wanted to just bring a message that hopefully just kind of resonates with you in a way that you start to make some decisions so you don't live in misery today because of what happened in the past, forgetting those things which are behind. Let's pray.